So that's our first kind of sub point here. What is righteousness? And I, I put here the, uh, the, the Greek and an um, English uh, transliteration um, for you so we can sound it out. So here in the, in the Greek, we have uh, dikaios, dikaiosin, and uh, dikaiosune, sorry, and then dikaiao. You can hear uh, the beginnings of those three Greek terms are dikai, right? All of them having that, that same, uh, those same uh, few letters, dikai. So dikaios, dikaiosune, and dikaiao. So dikaios means righteous. Just, it just means righteous or just, you could say. Uh, to, uh, to be righteous is to be just. Uh, this is speaking of about somebody. It's an attribute about a person or a work of somebody. So a person or a work or an action is righteous or can be righteous or just. So we see this so much when we, when we speak about God, that, God's, uh, that God himself is righteous, that God himself is just. When we look at dikaiosune, that middle term there, we're, it's, uh, it's, more, um, it's more of the noun, where it is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. It is an attribute. The noun as an attribute or a, a defining quality of God. His righteousness, his justice. It is, there, it is something about God or something about a person or an action. That, that there is righteousness and justice uh, that's what the world strives for, is justice, right? It is that noun, justice. We're looking for uh, uh, the presence of justice or the presence of righteousness. And then to, uh, to excuse me, the, the last term there is dikaiao. That is to declare righteous. It is to come to a verdict about somebody or to testify about a person so uh, to put this in, in in our terms here we would say uh, that god is dikaios god is righteous that he does that all his works are works of dikaiosune righteousness and so therefore because god is righteous and he does righteousness uh, or justice we can say of God, we can declare God, we can dikaiao of God, as it were, that he is righteous. Um, we see this in Romans, that by his work, especially in salvation, God himself is justified. That is, he is testifying, he is, his works testify back to himself that he is righteous. But what does this mean to be righteous? To be righteous or excuse me, righteousness is simply doing what is right. It is doing what is right. And you can see it right here uh, in, in the wording. Right, right? It, it, it's, it's almost too obvious. Righteousness, or to be righteous, is to do what is right? It is rightness, you could say. It is rightness. Uh, the ultimate standard that we must use to measure rightness is God himself. So God is the measurement 
or the standard of rightness that is opposed to wrongness or a sin. So sin is wrongness, righteousness is rightness. The standard by which we understand what is right and what is wrong is the nature of God himself. And he reveals his nature in the pages of Scripture. So, God himself is right. He is righteous. So, when we talk about God's righteousness, when we talk about God's righteousness, remember that it is simply, it simply means uh, that he aligns with the nature the character, the standards, and the will of God. So if God is the standard, if God's nature, his character, his standards, his will, if that is a standard of what is right, then for us to say God is righteous, we're saying that he lines up with himself. And for us to say, for man to be righteous and acceptable before God, we have to line up also with those standards of God, with the character and the nature, the perfections of God. More simply, who he is, what he's like, what he commands, and what he plans are all the standard. So let me, let me write that out for us. So his, his nature. His character. His standards. And his will. Or you could say those four things are his, his uh, who he is, what he's like, what he commands, and what he plans. Nature, character, standards, and will. Those are, that's the four pronged, uh, 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 those are the four categories in which we see the righteousness of God, where we see his nature. Uh, so this kind of general definition of lining up with the nature, the character, the standards, and the will of God, that lining up to those things is applied to both God and man. So God, when we talk about God, that he is righteous or just, yes, brother? Would, would, would his standards be with man? Exactly. Yes. Yes. So his standards is his com. His command. So the nature is who he is. The character is what he's like. Uh, his standards is are his commands. And his plans, or excuse me, his will are his plans, or you could say promises as well. His promises. Because oftentimes when we see an Old Testament prophecy and the, 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 the guarantee that he will fulfill that promise is his righteousness, that he is righteous. So God always acts in agreement to these things. He always acts in agreement to his nature. He never does anything that is contrary to his nature. He never does anything that is contrary or conflicting with his character. He never breaks his own rules, his standards. And he never makes a promise that he does not fulfill his will or his desires. Uh, this Greek word, again, dikaiosune, uh, that middle term there, refers, as far as we're concerned, it refers to the act of doing what God requires. Doing what God requires. That is righteousness or justice. We see that there is a uh, more 
general meaning here that, of course, we, we line up with God himself and his revealed scriptures. So when it comes to us, uh, this here cannot be said of us, right? We are not righteous. We are not just. Uh, this here, we, we, we cannot say that we do perfect righteousness or justice, that we line up with the character and the will of God and his commands. <clears throat> so, uh, so therefore, excuse me, so therefore, uh, God cannot declare of us on our own that we are righteous. The verdict is n that you are unrighteous, that you are unjust, you are not justified, that you are a sinner, condemned. So that's this, this, the opposite of this, the opposite of dikaiao, uh, to declare righteous, is to condemn. And that's all of us. That is the state that we are in. Rather than God declaring us righteous, looking at us on our own, God looks at the sinner and says, condemned, condemned. So let's get into some passages. I can tell that uh, this is, our, our brains are hurting already. How are we doing? Any questions so far? Okay. We're going to look at righteousness and justification in, in Galatians. That's, uh, uh, I guess, sub-point two there on your notes. Righteousness and justification in Galatians. So let's turn to the book of Galatians. That would be helpful. Galatians is, is just a wonderful book. Uh, a great remedy, a great book to go through if uh, you uh, maybe are coming out of Catholicism. A great book to study and to read through is Galatians because it shows our freedom from uh, uh, the legalism of, of cults and to false religions, our, our freedom from, from fulfilling the law in Christ in the gospel. So, uh, Galatians. So, G Galatians, just to kind of prep us here, Galatians, uh, the, the circumstances that prompted the writing of the letter, the, the reason why Paul wrote Galatians uh, to the church, to the churches in Galatia, uh, was that Paul was actually receiving news that the, the believers there in the churches were accepting a teaching into the church that was actually contrary or, or uh, uh, different than the teaching that he first delivered to them. Now, it's not clear exactly who uh, told Paul about this, but, but we can see from passages in Galatians that this is the case. For example... Galatians 1 6. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who you call by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. So we see here uh, from the pages of, of Galatians itself that the believers here in Galatia were deserting Christ. And the way that they were deserting uh, Christ was by believing a different gospel. Believing a different gospel. Uh, the exact uh, teaching and wording of this, this different gospel, uh, we're not exactly uh, sure. Uh, we can't exactly uh, say what it was, but it seems like uh, that it was closely tied to the Jewish law. It seems like uh, these believers were going back to uh, the religion that they had just left, uh, the Old Testament Jewish law. 
the false teachers here that are being uh, uh, taught against, the false teachers were promoting the ideas that uh, these new converts had to uh, obey Jewish laws. For example, circumcision. Galatians 5, uh, verse 2 through 6 says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, uh, Christ will be of no benefit to you. So you see, he, he, why does he address circumcision? Well, it's because it seems like these believers are being drawn into this belief that you have to do something else to really be a Christian. So he's saying, if you do receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And he says in verse 3, I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. So he says, if you want to go back to that old law, you have to understand you got to keep it all. You have to obey all of it, all of Old Testament law. You can't just pick and choose you know, what, what you're going to bring over and, and obligate yourself uh, to obey in order to be a peop the people of God. You see, what they're saying is, this is different than how we view the law. See, we view the law as, as God's inerrant word, fulfilled in Christ, and still at the same time holding uh, sway, holding authority over our lives today, in that, uh, especially the, the Ten Commandments and the, uh, uh, oh man, the civil law, I believe it is. No, the judicial law. Uh, uh, regarding the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not practice idolatry, all those things. Uh, we believe that we are obligated to obey those because those are timeless truths. Uh, when it comes to the ceremonial law, though, like circumcision, the sacrifices, the, the priesthood, all of those things, we believe all of that stuff was fulfilled in Christ. We no longer have to obey those things in order to truly be a practicing Christian. Okay? These people were saying, no, we got to go back. We have to go back. We have to practice circumcision. And Paul says, if you, if you think that you have to be circumcised in order to be a Christian, then who's to hold you back? What holds you back from saying you have to go to the temple in order to be a Christian? You have to eat these, you have to follow this, this dietary law in order to be a Christian. What holds you back from that? You, you're obligated to keep the whole law, he says. He goes on, verse 4. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified, the, from, justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Verse 6. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. So we see here that these believers in Galatia were uh, being drawn back to their old life. Uh, and, and these false teachers are, are basically telling the church, no, you have to go back to your roots. You have to go back to Judaism in order to really be a Christian. And uh, Paul has these very strong words in Galatians 5.12. He says, I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Very graphic language. He's because uh, I'm trying to keep this PG. Uh, understanding what circumcision is, he's saying those people that are telling you you got to get circumcised, I wish they would mutilate themselves. And he's saying uh, if they want you to cut yourselves, why aren't they willing to cut themselves? He says, I wish they would. Very strong language, very uh, 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 sharp, and uh, uh, what's the word? I don't want to say impatient, because we just taught that we can't be impatient. 
<laughs> uh, he, he's defending the, the gospel, right? So he, he is, this is, he's drawing a line in the sand, and he's defending the flock, you can see. And so even at the expense of coming off as harsh or, or, uh, or mean-spirited, it's not out of hatred or, or, or uh, meanness towards these people. It's out of a love for the gospel, a love for the flock, because these false teachers are, are uh, imposing law upon the gospel. In Galatians 4, we see also uh, more proof that the Galatians were being drawn away from the simplicity of the gospel back to Judaism. He says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. So they're, they're being drawn back to the festival observances like, uh, se- like the, um, the uh, Sabbath day, the um, uh, Passover, Feast of Booths, um, all of those uh, uh, Old Testament festivals that are fulfilled in Christ that we are not obligated to fulfill anymore. He's saying, you're doing those things too. Uh, and, and even food restrictions, even the dietary laws. Um, we see this in chapter 2. He says, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him face to face because he stood condemned. Well, how so? Prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. Okay, so Cephas... Uh, was eating with the Gentiles. That is Peter. Uh, Cephas was eating with the Gentiles, but, but when a certain men from James came, that, that is, uh, Jews came, uh, he began to withdraw from the Gentiles and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision, fearing the Jews. And what happened was the rest of the Jews joined Cephas, joined Peter uh, in his uh, hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Verse 14, but when, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, I said, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, How is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? What is he saying there? He's saying, uh, Cephas, you're a Jew, and and you're you're living like the Gentiles. You're fellowshipping with the Gentiles. How is it that you compel now, all of a sudden, how is it that you've flipped, and now you're compelling Gentiles to now live like Jews? I thought you were free from the, the Jewish law, and you now you're living like a Gentile? And, and all of a sudden you're, you're, you flipped, and now you're drawing Gentiles back into Judaism? What is this? And what it comes down to is that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. They weren't holding to the truth of the gospel. They were holding, they were saying that they believed the gospel, but they weren't practicing that they believed in the gospel. They were putting weight back onto their old religion. Now, what, uh, what disturbed Paul was the enforcement or the acceptance of things like circumcision as a legal obligation as though they were essential for salvation or essential for the membership in the community of the people of God. That's what disturbed Paul. That's what he was so uh, hostile against was this enforcement of some other law in order to be saved or in order to be a member of the the Christian community. That's what was happening. It's a false teaching. It is a false teaching 
that requires anything but faith in the person and work of Christ as the only means for salvation. So if there is any teaching that adds to faith in Christ, now I know we've been talking about repentance and faith, but when we talk about a true understanding of faith, what we mean is letting go of your past life so that you can lay hold of Christ in faith. So a, a full understanding of faith, all you need is true faith in the person and work of Christ, which of course involves repentance. All, that's all you need for salvation. That's all you need to be in the community of, of believers. Paul was so convinced of this truth and was so compelled by this truth of the gospel that he wrote Galatians. He wrote a stern and urgent letter to the churches in Galatia to call them back to the pure gospel. That's Galatians. Okay? Paul wrote this letter to respond to the false teaching of finding justification before God by adding to the work of Christ on the cross. So he wrote Galatians to respond to the false teaching of gospel plus works, essentially. Gospel plus works. Or Jesus plus me. The Jewish false teachers in Galatia were essentially adding to the cross of Christ. That's basically what they were doing. When we think of this verse here, back in Galatians 1.6, that's what they were doing. They were adding to the cross of Christ. That's the different gospel, not the true gospel. They were saying that essentially the cross of Christ is not enough to restore your relationship with God. That what Jesus did is not enough. When it really comes down to it, that's what they were teaching. Now, Paul wrote Galatians to squash that kind of teaching. Even so far as, uh, even going so far as to call down a curse, an anathema on anyone, including himself, who would teach a different gospel. So in Galatians uh, 3, this, this is our main, our main text for this morning. Galatians 3, verses 6 through 9. Can somebody please read that for us? Thank you. That's our main text this morning. Uh, so in, in this passage, in, in these few verses, what Paul is doing is he is basically defending, he's defending uh, what he says in Galatians 2, verse 16, where he says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. I mean, that's pretty clear, right? So to... To be justified, that is uh, to be declared righteous by God. To be justified, for God to look at us and say, righteous, accepted because you're righteous. Not only not guilty, but 
righteous on top of it. In order for us to receive that declaration about ourselves, these false teachers would say, well, you have to get circumcised. You really want to be righteous. You've got to get circumcised. You've got to follow the festivals. You have to uh, observe the dietary laws. You have to do all these things. You have to check off all these boxes. But here, in order for God to say that about you, well, what needs to happen according to this verse? What do you, what do you see, brothers and sisters? Yeah. We are justified by faith in Christ. And he says it so many different ways, right? Notice all the times that he says this word, justified. And this is the theme. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. So not justified by the works of the law, but you could say justified through faith in Christ Jesus. And he says, knowing that, he says, uh, uh, knowing that truth, therefore we have believed. We have believed. Understanding that I can't justify myself, but I have uh, this free offer of justification in Christ, and we'll, we'll explain how that's possible in the weeks to come, but knowing that Christ offers me that verdict in him by faith, I believe in him because I know I can't justify myself. You see that? He says, we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified, there it is again, justified by faith in Christ, and again, not justified by the works of the law. Why? Why can't we be justified by the works of the law? Or, or yeah, why, why would I, excuse me, why would I believe in Christ alone, and not try and earn my justification? Well, it's because, or since, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. You see his, his flow of logic? I understand, first of all, I know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but rather through faith in Christ. And knowing that, Knowing that truth, therefore, I have placed my faith in Christ alone so that we may be justified by faith and in Christ and not by works of the law. After all, he says, or, or since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. You see, no matter how many laws you obey, no matter how many uh, requirements you fulfill, None of it can earn you that verdict of righteous. None of it. That's what he's saying here. In Galatians 3, also in Galatians 3, verses 1 through 5, uh, Paul supports this gospel truth with a personal salvation experience of the Galatians. He, he appeals to what they've gone through. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Bef before whose eyes Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. He says, answer me, just answer me this. Did, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? Or by hearing with faith? How did you first receive the Holy Spirit? Was it by the, did you earn him? Or was it simply by faith? Verse three, are you so foolish? Having begun by, by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you, did you suffer so many th things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you. Excuse me. So then does he who provides you with the spirit and works miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of the law? Or by hearing with faith? Which is it? Galatians. 
He said, how did, you, how did this all get started with you? Was it by works that you earned uh, uh, the, the, the right to have the Spirit indwell within you? Or was it simply by faith that you received him? Of course it was by faith. And so he says, well, if that's how you started your relationship with the Spirit, you're, if that's how you started your relationship with God, your walk with God, why are you, why are you abandoning faith? As if I had to believe to get in, but now I have to work to keep. And I have to work in order to, to, uh, to keep my right standing with God. That's what they were doing. And, and isn't that what we do? Isn't that how we think, just kind of by default? That we understand the gospel that uh, uh, it's, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, we understand that we are justified freely as a gift of his grace, and we enjoy that, we sing about that. But then when it comes to our day-to-day -day walk with God, we think that we have to earn his favor somehow that day. Don't we do that? If we're not careful. Don't, don't we lull ourselves back into Judaism or legalism? So you see how, how uh, important this is for us to get. This has to do with your daily walk with Christ. You don't have to earn his love again today, Christian. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to keep. It's not up to you to keep your salvation. It's up to you to respond to your salvation but not keep it. Oh, no. So, verse 6, uh, Galatians 3, verse 6, back to our, our, our main text. In verse 6 through 9, Paul uses the Old Testament scripture to support the gospel truth of justified by faith in Christ alone. He goes back to the Old Testament to prove it. Now, verse 6. In verse 6, Paul points to Abraham as the prime example of being counted righteous by faith alone. That is justified by faith alone. In verse 6 here, we see that Abraham believed. Now, that's, that's faith. Abraham believed in God. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Reckoned to him as righteousness. And that, that word reckon is legitimized. That, that it's been best understood as accounted. Accounted. It was accounted to him as righteousness. So his faith, his belief in God, on the basis of his simple belief and faith upon God's promises, Abraham was accounted righteousness. He was, excuse me, accounted righteousness. This is the idea of reckoning in the sight of God. So God considered Abraham at that point righteous. Based off of what? Based simply here on his faith. You believe me? I can, I, now I consider you, when I look at you, Abraham, I consider you righteous. That's the transaction. That's the transaction. Uh, the, the same word is used, yeah, I don't have it here. The same word is used in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, meaning to, to count up, to take account of as in a ledger or a notebook. It is, uh, it's, it's an accounting term. To count or to credit is the idea. So, he says, even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure, verse 7, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. So in verse 7, what Paul's doing here 
is he connects the faith of the Galatian believers and us, he connects our faith to that of Abraham by the strongest earthly kind of connection. What's that connection? How does he connect us with him? What's our connection with with Abraham? Sons. Yes. Sons. And it's on the basis of belief. Yes. We are sons of Abraham. That is the strongest earthly kind of connection between uh, two people in, in many respects. The, the kind of connection that we have with Abraham is a familial, a familial, a, a family connection. We are part of the family of Abraham, as it were, sons of Abraham. And the, the basis of that relationship the reason why we can be considered the, as the same family as Abraham is faith. It's this faith. Those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was defined by his faith in God, you see. He believed God. And so, just like Abraham, though we are Gentiles, we are, we are sons of of Abraham, his children, because of that faith. That's what connects us. That's what relates us to him, is our faith in God. Uh, Luther says, it is a true and right opinion of the heart. Faith only thinks and judges rightly of God when he believes his word. So faith is taking God at his word. It is trusting in the word of God, in his promises. That's faith. And trusting in him and what he says in his word. Now this this doesn't mean faithfulness of life in the sense of fidelity or loyalty to God, but the fact that Abraham believed God, and so we believe God, believe the promise of the gospel. When God declares to us that you can that Christ bore our wrath on the cross and that he uh, uh, was our substitute under the wrath of God so that we might not have to Uh, suffer that judgment, but rather by faith, having our debt canceled there on the cross, by faith we can be now accepted in the sight of God, receiving his forgiveness, his adoption, and his love, having eternal life in Christ alone. Believing that wonderful truth, that wonderful promise of the gospel, when we believe in that, the same transaction that happened with Abraham happens with us. God reckons us as righteous. We are justified. He declares righteous. He speaks that of us. Lastly, in verses 8 through 9, Paul here, he, he links the Galatians' present righteous standing before God in Christ with the blessing promised to Abraham. You see, he says, the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. Verse 9, so then those who are of faith are blessed. So, those who are of faith... That's you and I, and that's Abraham. We are of faith. We believe God. We are blessed along with Abraham, the believer, who is also of faith. See that connection between us and Abraham again. Now, I want want to show you this connection, though. Those who are of faith are blessed. What's the blessing? What's the blessing? Well, he says back here in verse 8, all the nations will be blessed in you. 
right? That's the promise. So he, the, the promise, the gospel beforehand, the, the, the proto-gospel, right? The, 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 the gospel before the gospel, as it were, um, that was declared to Abraham was, all the nations will be blessed in you. And the next verse, as we just mentioned, says that those who are of faith are blessed. So the way to get this blessing is faith, right? Faith is what, what grants us that blessing. So what he's not saying is just, is simply uh, that uh, all of Israel, just because they're your offspring, all of your offspring will, will be blessed in you. Uh, because because they're your child. No, because well, why do we know that? Well, because first of all, it's the nations. It's all the nations. So it's not simply their, your, your familial connection to Abraham, but rather this faith connection to Abraham is what he's getting at. So in order to be blessed, you must have faith. That's what verse 9 says. What's the blessing? Foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles. How do we know that this is the blessing? Well, look at the wording. Foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. He says, preaching that, that God was preaching the gospel beforehand to Abraham when he said the nations, notice this connection between nations and Gentiles, will be blessed in you is the connection to the justification. And of course, the next verse says that the way to get that blessing is by faith. So we see from verse 9 that this faith is connected to what God was preaching beforehand. So the gospel that was being preached beforehand to Abraham was that when, when he said, all the nations will be blessed in you, that by the, the, the faith of the nations, they will, they will find blessing, is that by faith, the Gentiles will be justified. That's what he's saying. So th th this, is a, this is striking because all the way back in Genesis, right? All the way back in Genesis, what was promised was that you and I today would, be, would find this blessing of justification by faith. That was, that was anticipated back in Genesis. Yes, brother. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it's not some different salvation. God, God didn't have to, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a new grace, right? They were saved by faith. We are saved by faith. They were saved by faith looking forward to their Messiah. We're, we're saved by faith looking back to our Messiah. So we see that this, uh, this blessing that we are given is by faith and Paul proves it that you are justified by faith alone that you are declared righteous in the sight of God by faith alone he proves it from Genesis he proves it from the first book of the Old Testament and he, what he's saying is it's been this way all along Galatians if you want to go back to Judaism you have to understand, this is really what you're going back to. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Uh, if, you, if you really want to go back to the Old Testament, it's always been by faith. It's always been justification by faith. Nothing has changed. It's just now we have more light and more understanding of these truths. This idea of blessing will be contrasted to being cursed uh, later on. Just as just really quick before, because I want to I want to finish 
this section on Galatians really quickly here. It says, as many are the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Remember when, when Paul was saying, look, if you want to be circumcised, you, got, you have to do the whole law in order to be justified. If you want to be justified by works, then you got to do it all. But he says, if you're going to try and do that, and, and if you fail on one point, you're cursed. You're condemned. That's why we were saying earlier, uh, the opposite of justification is condemnation. It's this cursing. That's our state. And so you have, you have the choice, he's saying. You can either try and, in this cursed, condemned state, <clears throat> excuse me, try and, you can either try and earn God's, God's verdict of righteous by just being good enough and checking off all the boxes, or you can fully rest in the finished work of Christ, believe on him, and be declared righteous fully and completely. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. So, just in conclusion, what we're saying is this. All of mankind has broken the law of God, failing to be righteous just as God is righteous. Remember these, these terms that we looked at at the beginning. I want to come back to them to kind of help them settle in our brains. <laughs> uh, all of mankind has broken the law Failing to be righteous, failing at this point, to be righteous, just as God is righteous. The result, the result is that all mankind stand con stands condemned or cursed, the opposite of this term, the opposite of dikaiao, the opposite of being declared righteous or justified. Because we, have, we lack the righteousness of God, therefore, we are condemned or cursed in our sins. And we are now completely unable to merit God's or earn God's salvation by any good works. Therefore, there must be some sort of you could, you could say a counteracting judgment of God against this already condemned state of the sinner. This is where truth, the truth of justification comes in. The alternative, one theologian says, the alternative that Paul rejects is not a justification linked with particular demands of the law, but justification by the law itself, whose requirement of righteousness, righteousness works, uh, distinguishes it from the path of faith and grace. God, on the basis of the, of the substitutionary life and substitutionary death of Christ, God, on that basis, is able to declare that a believing sinner somebody who is, is declared condemned is now righteous simply by faith in Christ. So I am condemned like Abraham and simply because I believe upon the promises of God and the person and work of Christ, simply because of my faith, he declares me no longer condemned, but now the verdict is righteous. Righteous. Simply by faith. This is now, this is now our state, Christians. We are declared righteous. 
If you have faith in Christ, you are declared righteous. And, and how God views you is not that you have no longer broken his law, that you are no longer unrighteous or unjust, but how he views you is how he views his son. Righteous and just, completely. Now we're going to see in the weeks to come how uh, that is applied to us. We're going we're gonna to look at, in the weeks to come, uh, the righteousness of Christ and how that is that righteousness of Christ, that perfection of Christ, is transferred to us. What that means and what that looks like. All right? So I trust that this is a good kind of introduction. Kind of uh, 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 we're setting the groundwork for the weeks to come. So I trust that you would come and, and fill in the rest of those, those notes in the, in the coming weeks. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these truths, Lord. Uh, uh, this, this gospel that we hold so dearly, is, it, it, it strips us of our pride, Lord. This gospel, if we really understand it, is not something that, that, uh, that a human being could come up with on his own. Uh, because this, this strips us of any good work that would earn any standing before you. It strips us of all, any, any amount of pride and self-righteousness that we might have. And, it, and it, it robs us of all those things and makes us completely, completely and absolutely reliant on your son to, to give us his righteousness. It makes us completely dependent upon you, Father, to declare about us what we know is not true of us, what we know is, is the opposite of what we really are. We are the polar opposite of righteous. We, we are sinners, rebels, condemned before your law. And yet, Lord, we, we are so thankful this morning that through Christ you can speak about us righteous you can look at us and truly genuinely say you are my righteous child with whom i am well pleased oh god what a treasure that that is for us help us lord to remember this week that we don't have to earn your favor each and every day that that it has been earned and completely uh, given to us in christ that we don't have to try and earn back your your love for us we simply need to walk in it and enjoy it in Christ. Thank you for these truths. Help us to worship now as we enter into our next hour, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.